My son and I had the opportunity to go on a short camping and hunting trip day before yesterday, and I think while we were in the woods, or potentially while we were eating some camp food, you might say, we came into contact with something that has broken both him and me out. I don't know if you can tell, but I have a rash on my face this morning. I'm trying to cover that up with these glasses as best I can. But due to some medication that I'm taking, I'm running a little bit hot. And so I, I, have, I have elected not to wear a, a coat presently. And if, if that offends anyone, I am sorry. Uh, but I, I feel like that may be the best thing for me to do this hour. I'm not feeling in tip-top shape. Matthew chapter 21, we discussed the parable of the two sons during the Bible class hour. Now as we come to the parable of the wicked husbandmen or the wicked farmers, if you will, the word husbandmen simply means farmers and in this instance particularly it refers to vine dressers, if you will. As we come to this parable we come to the complement of the former, that is the complement to the parable of the two sons. I want to share with you some observations made by Linsky in his uh, rather good commentary on the book of Matthew, he said the parable of the two sons looked backward to the past, revisiting the ministry of John the baptizer. And we talked about that last hour. But this parable, the parable of the wicked husbandman, looked to both the present back then as well as to the future, addressing not merely the rejection of John, but addressing more specifically the rejection of Christ Himself and even His ultimate murder. And so that's interesting how these two parables kind of fit together. The parable of the two sons look backward to John. This parable looks to the present and to the future, namely the rejection and the murder that was coming upon Jesus Christ. Something else Linsky observed. The parable of the two sons addressed the Jewish leaders as ordinary people in their own right. You know, even though they were leaders over the Jews, they were still people. And so that first parable, the parable we discussed in the morning Bible class hour, it addressed them as people, just as people accountable to God. In other words, in contrast to the harlots and the publicans, as people, they rejected John, whereas the harlots and the publicans submitted to the preaching of John. Now, this parable, however, approaches things differently. It addresses the accountability of the Jewish leaders, not just merely as individuals themselves, but even more as rulers entrusted with the stewardship of God's nation, which back then, of course, was the nation of Israel. When Linsky brought that out, I found that interesting. I never had thought about that. And so in the first parable, they're people just like you and I. But in this parable, they're leaders, particularly entrusted with a charge. Now, I want to add my own observation here that I've gained from studying this the last week or so. I think it's helpful maybe if we think of the first parable, the parable of the two sons, as being spoken to the leaders, but spoken in the hearing of, of the people, the common people. And here perhaps it's different. In fact, Luke in his account of this parable, Luke chapter 20 and verse 9, if you want to compare that, Luke tells us specifically that the parable of the wicked husbandman was spoken to the people, the common people. But it's obvious as we study the three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that it was also spoken in the hearing of the Jewish leaders. And so if that's correct, then again, the roles are somewhat flip-flopped. 
The first one spoken to the leaders, but in the hearing of the people, because this was a very public place in the grounds of the temple, but this one spoken to the people in the hearing of the Jewish leadership. And so it's, it's very interesting, God in His wisdom, Christ in His wisdom, how that these two complement each other so wonderfully uh, in this chapter, Matthew chapter 21. Now, what we're going to do, this, this is not going to be as in-depth as the Bible study hour because obviously we do not have the same amount of time. But what I want us to do is I want us to break down the parable into three sections, or better yet, maybe lessons from the parable into three sections or headings. Number one, we're going to learn some lessons about God from the parable of the wicked husbandman. Number two, we're going to learn some lessons about preaching. And then number three, we're going to learn some lessons about sin. Lessons about God, lessons about preaching, and lessons about sin. One of the restraints that I have with my voice is I have to keep my my throat very moist. I knew when I looked down and didn't see my water, I had to do something. All right, let's look to the parable now. Matthew 21, it begins in verse 33. It goes all the way, basically, you might say, to the end of the chapter, verses 45 or 46, would contain the context. Let's learn, first of all, lessons about God. Very quickly, three or four things about God. First of all, we learn about God's omniscience and God's foreknowledge, His knowing things ahead of time, in that this parable, as it was given by Jesus, is proof positive that the rejection and the murder of Christ did not catch God off guard. It couldn't have caught God off guard because right here in this very parable, Jesus foretold it. In so many words, He's telling perhaps the people, but the leaders are there to hear it, He's he's telling the people that I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be murdered, okay? And so lesson number one about God is you can't catch God off guard. The way the late Brother Curtis Cates used to put it, God is never caught unprepared for any contingency. God is never caught unprepared for any contingency. Contingency. Now notice in the parable, beginning at verse 37, I appreciate the brother very much for reading some of the earlier verses. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Him. Right there, Jesus is predicting his own ultimate rejection, his own death. Okay? You cannot catch God off guard. In fact, a little while later in Acts chapter 2 on the great day of Pentecost, Peter was preaching, and remember how he told the masses that him, referring to Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. God had determined in His counsel or in His wisdom. God knew in His foreknowledge what was going to happen. That's an important lesson to keep in mind always, of course, about our Heavenly Father. Number two, lesson number two about God from this parable. And this is a sobering lesson. God will not, and I have that capitalized on my outline, God will not be mocked with impunity. In other words, we as frail creatures, and that's really all you and I are. As human beings, we are no more than frail creatures created by God and His almighty power. We will not mock God with impunity. Okay? Now, we might might mock God for a while. We might even mock, and it's hard for a country boy to say mock. You know what? I want to say mock. I guess that's what I need to say. We might mock God for an extended period of time. But you or I, we will not do that with impunity. In other words, we will not do that indefinitely without ultimately being called into account. And that that is seen here in verses 40 and 41. Jesus gets near to the end of the parable and He says, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will He do unto those husbandmen? 
In other words, as, as the brother read for us, they have beaten and, and killed and even stoned some of the servants that he has sent unto them. Last of all, they've even killed now his son that he sent unto them. What will the Lord do to those wicked husbandmen when he comes? Verse 41, now I understand this to be the people to respond. Uh, I taught this uh, Wednesday night at home and, and people in our class thought it was the Jewish leaders themselves who were responding. That may be, that may be. I suspect after they responded in verse 31 in response to the first parable and Jesus turned that on, on them so masterfully the way that he did, I suspect they weren't so quick to speak up here. In my mind, I picture the common people hanging on every word as Jesus utters this parable. And so when he says what's going to happen to these husbandmen, I think they blurred out. Verse 41, he will miserably destroy those miserable or wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other farmers, other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And so God will not be mocked with impunity. You know, from time to time in the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit prefaces a great statement of truth with the admonition, be not deceived, right? I think of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good uh, manners or good morals. I think any time we see that preface attached to a statement, that perhaps that statement is one of truth to which you and I may be particularly prone to be blinded to it. We, we, we may have a tendency as human beings not to listen to it. And so God carefully tells us, don't be deceived, don't be deceived. Well, the reason I say that is because in Galatians 6 and verse 7, we find that phrase again, that preface, be not deceived, and then Paul adds, God is not mocked. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And here in this passage, this parable, we see that lesson demonstrated quite clearly. Number three, now this is my favorite lesson probably about God from this parable. And that is the extraordinary, and I use that word, extraordinary, long-suffering of God is beautifully pictured in this parable. Folks, the long-suffering of God is one of the most comforting biblical themes I know. It's, it, I love to preach and to tell audiences such as this one about the great long-suffering of God. But you know what? It's pictured right here in this parable. In, in verse 34, he sent some hus he sent some servants rather to the husbandmen. In verse 35, they took them, they beat some of them, they killed others of them, and others they stoned. Now that, that is an escalation. A beating is not necessarily fatal. A killing is fatal, but then a stoning is a death reserved for a criminal. And so not only did these husbandmen show the utmost disregard and disrespect for the Lord of the vineyard, but they even treated the Lord's servants, some of them at least, as criminals in stoning them. And so ultimately that would imply that the Lord himself of the vineyard would be criminal. And yet what does the Lord do in the parable? Something that we would not do in, in normal life, everyday life. Verse 36, again, notice that word, again, he sent other servants more than the first. But they did unto them likewise. I want to share with you something else that Linsky brought out in his comments. He said, unlike most other parables, this parable is not true to life. Now think about that. Because everything we've taught our little ones in Sunday school classes through the years is that a parable is what? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we emphasize that it, it, it's a true-to-life story. It, it's a story that, that didn't necessarily happen, but it could have happened. Okay? For example, with the parable of the two sons, in our minds we could see a father going to both of his sons and telling them, go work today in my vineyard. That's very plausible. This parable is an exception. This is not going to happen in real life. In real life, when the, the landlord or the owner of the vineyard sends his first drove of servants, 
and they're killed and mistreated the way that they are, he's likely not going to send another drove of servants. If anything, he's going to send a small army, if you will, and he's going to destroy those wicked husbandmen and he's going to take back his farm. You with me? But that's not what we read in the parable. It is not plausible that any group of tenant farmers, number one, would ever act so presumptuously themselves as we see these acting in the parable. And certainly no landowner would ever send so many of his own delegates in vain, culminating ultimately with the jeopardizing of his own son. That's not true to life. Now, someone says, well, wait a minute, Cliff. You've thrown a wrench in everything I've ever learned about parables. Why is it not true to life? Well, I believe the exception here teaches the great lesson. These unrealistic aspects of the parable highlight the fact that God's long-suffering is really unlike anything else we know in this temporal world. In other words, if it weren't true, but it is, we might be tempted to say that the long-suffering of God is too good to be true. But praise be to Him, it's not. The long-suffering of God is unlike anything else we've experienced in this world. Let me tell you how I know that. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, Paul uses two preface statements. You, must, you probably pick up on the fact that I'm big on preface statements. He says, number one, this is a faithful saying. Okay? It's credible, reliable, and true. And number two, and worthy of all acceptation. In other words, because of its truthfulness, its credibility, everybody ought to hear and accept what I'm about to say. What are you about to say, Paul? That Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And then he adds, of whom I am chief. A lot of commentators dismiss that as hyperbole. They just dismiss it as over-modesty on the sake of Paul. I'm not so quick to do so. And I'll tell you why. And it's because of the next verse. Verse 16, he continues the very same thought. He says, how be it? I received mercy. Let's, let's go there. I don't know that I can quote it. Look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse 16 because this is a beautiful point that drives home this present lesson we learn about God. And, and I love preaching this point. Paul says, How be it, even though Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, how be it, for this cause I obtained mercy. Why would God choose to save the chief of sinners. Why? He had a reason. That in me first, first is the Greek word protos, which we get the word prototype. Saul of Tarsus was the prototypical sinner. Don't miss that. God saved the prototypical sinner. He saved the chief of sinners, Saul of Tarsus, in order that he might show forth all long suffering. Folks, to me, that's one of the most beautiful statements in all of Scripture. In Acts chapter 7, as Saul is standing there with the clothes of the witnesses at his feet, watching Stephen, innocent Stephen, being stoned to death, God's long-suffering waited. In Acts chapter 8, as Saul made havoc of the church, God's long-suffering waited. Waited. In Acts chapter 9, as Saul breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, even under strange cities such as the city of Damascus, God's long suffering waited. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Listen to me, dear friends. God saved the chief of sinners because He wanted you and me to know that He can save us. In that salvation of Saul, the extraordinary long-suffering of God is easily seen. Lesson number four, the last lesson about God from this parable, as you go back, if you wish, to Matthew 21. However, God's long-suffering, as extraordinary as it is, God's long-suffering is not interminable. Interminable. 
In other words, it's not without an end. Sooner or later, the long suffering of God will come to an end, even though it's unlike anything else we know in this world. And praise be to God for that, how grateful we are for that fact. But it will come to an end. And so verse 43 here, Jesus comments. This is where he drives the parable home. Incidentally, verse 43 is the main lesson of the parable. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. The Jewish people altogether, yes. The Jewish leaders particularly, yes. And given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. God's long suffering is not interminable. And so we've learned four lessons, very important lessons, I believe, about God. Number two, let's learn some lessons also about preaching. And you say, well, how do you learn lessons about preaching here? Well, number one, because Jesus himself in giving this parable was preaching. In fact, Luke in his account, Luke chapter 20, he tells us at verse one that while at the temple or the temple grounds, Jesus preached the gospel. Okay, and that's the same context as right here, Matthew chapter 21. And so two lessons about preaching. Number one, love and speaking the truth in love does not preclude clarity and straightforwardness. Now let that sink in for just a minute. And as you let it sink in, I'll try to state it a different way. A man can love lost souls, a man can love God and love the truth and still preach the truth in a way that is clear, straightforward, pricking the heart and unmistakable. And you say, Cliff, how do you get this out of the parable? Well, because of the parable itself. Because of the parable itself. That's exactly what Jesus Christ said. This is a very pointed parable. And and it said probably... Probably to the people, but it's said in the hearing of the Jewish leaders. And it's unmistakable the point that he's making. You see what I mean? You get this better from Luke's account though. Hold your place here, Mark, Matthew 21. And let's go back to Luke 20, to which I've already referred a couple of times. And so verse 15, so Jesus is wrapping up the parable in Luke 20, verse 15. So they cast him out of the vineyard, that is the son, the heir, and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? Now, I believe that at this point the people interject and they answer. That's my opinion. I can't necessarily prove that. But I think we read the people's answer in Matthew's account. And then here what we read in the next verse, verse 16, is perhaps our Lord's confirming what they just said. Jesus said, He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And here I think we have a pronoun shift. I can't prove it, but I believe we have a pronoun shift. And when they heard it, I picture the Jewish leadership as being mum. They're, they're, they're not so quick to speak because the, the time they spoke before with the first parable, it didn't turn out too well. But when they hear the, the people's response that we read in Matthew 21, and then they hear Jesus confirm it and say, that's right, here in verse 16, the leaders speak up, I believe, and they said, God forbid. In other words, may it never be so. We, we don't want that because they knew what the parable meant. Verse 17, and he beheld them. This shows us the directness and the straightforwardness of what Jesus is doing here in his preaching. Uh, Brother McCord in his translation of this translates it, he looked directly at them, directly at them. It's the same word used of the rich young ruler in Mark 10 and verse 21, Jesus beheld him and loved him. And in that passage in Mark 10, McCord translates it, Jesus looked into him. And so maybe here there's not only the directness of our Lord's gaze, but also the probing nature of his insight. He's looking into their their wicked hearts. And he says, what is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. 
Friends, Jesus was a gospel preacher who did not mince words. And that's the first lesson we can learn about preaching here from this parable, that love, and love is, is an absolute necessity. Any preacher who does not do his work in love is doing an injustice, a grave injustice to the cause of Christ. But speaking the truth in love does not preclude or rule out clarity, being clear about what you mean, and straightforwardness, speaking directly to the, to the audience. And we see that in Jesus. Lesson number two now about truth, or about preaching rather. Truth is often derided. It's often made light of and mocked. But such does not change truth's validity. I mean, let me put that the way my daddy put it to me all my life growing up at home, so much that I've probably quoted it here at East Hill. My daddy would say, the truth is the truth, and the truth will stand when the world is on fire. Truth is the truth. Here in the parable, as you go back to Matthew 21, most of your conservative commentators, when they look at those two groups of prophet or servants rather that were sent to the husbandman before the son was sent, they see the Old Testament prophets whom Jesus sent to his nation throughout the centuries desiring the fruits of repentance. And yet they were mocked. They were derided. The truth that they proclaimed was derided and rejected. But you know what? It was still the truth. It was still the truth. And we learn that here in the parable. So number one, lessons about God. Number two, lessons about preaching. Now number three, let's wrap up this study by noticing two or three lessons about sin. First of all, we see how ugly the sin of ingratitude really is. If you were to boil down the rebellion of the husbandman in this parable, is it not, in its simplest form, is it not pure ingratitude? I mean, the, the Lord of the vineyard had done all the work. He had made the vineyard sustainable. He had, had done everything that needed to be done to it according to verse 33. And then He leased it out, not for a sum of money. He leased it out for a portion of the fruits a portion of the proceeds thereof to these husbandmen. Was their rebellion not the height of ingratitude, unthankfulness for what the Lord of the vineyard had done? But I'll go a step even further. When we look at sin in general, and we, when we look at the sin in my life and the sin in your life, is it not often the case that our own sin and rebellion is laced with the poison of ingratitude? Is it not the case that you and I lose sight of how truly blessed we have been and we are? How truly good God is to us? Like the Father in the preceding parable, He's affectionate to us. He regards us not merely as sons, but as His children. Ultimately, I think all sin, or, or nearly all sin has to involve ingratitude of some sort. And we see that in the parable. Lesson number two about sin, though, we see the irrationality of sin. I remember one day in class, I don't remember the exact day, but Brother Keith Mosier, one of our instructors in the Memphis School of Preaching, he went so far as to say in class, he said, sin is stupid. You know, I don't know necessarily about everybody else, but it kind of got my attention. I perked up. Sin is stupid. Now parents, I apologize if you're teaching your children not to use that word. I'll give you an opportunity now to go home and <laughs> teach them when it is appropriate. <laughs> I'm a firm believer that there are times when that word's appropriate. And sadly here, maybe the more academic way of saying it is, sin is irrational. Did the wicked husbandman really think for a moment that when they mistreated and killed that first group of servants that were sent to them, did they really think for a moment they were going to get away with it? And the right answer probably would be they weren't thinking at all. 
And neither are you and I when we sin and when we live in sin. When when the second group of servants came and they did likewise unto them, were they really thinking they were going to get away with it? And then ultimately, as we see right there in verse 38, look back at the parable. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. Did they really think That's the way it was going to go down. I'm telling you here this morning with love and respect, I'm telling you, sin is stupid. Sin is irrational. And we learn that lesson and we see the ugly irrationality of it in this parable. But now number three, a final lesson about sin. We see how hardened hardened a person can become in prolonged sin. Prolonged sin in a person's life that's not repented of, it's not corrected, instead it's permitted to lodge in one's heart and to become a a reality in one's daily life. Friends, that is a scary, scary scenario. Because here in this parable, we see what that sin does to a person's heart. It hardens their heart, for example, even to the point that these Jewish leaders could stand there and could listen to this parable, knowing that that it condemned them because the previous parable had condemned them. And I believe even responding to it in Luke 20 and verse 16 by saying, God forbid, may it never be so, may what you're telling telling us here, may it not come to pass. They could stand and hear the truth. And then I want you to know their reaction. Verse 45 of of Matthew 21. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived, the other accounts, Matthew and Mark, I think, say, they knew that He spake of them. And so what did they do? It it melted their hearts and they repented right then and there. And they were wanting to to do right. No, no, I, I wish they had. Verse 46, but when they sought to lay hands on him. I like the way Linsky or or maybe another writer described it. They would have killed Jesus right then and there. You listening to me? They would have killed Jesus right then and there. Had it not been for the multitude. Had it not been for the people. Friends, we see how hardened in sin a soul can become. As we close our Bibles and as we take our songbooks out or prepare to sing the invitation song, as you can tell, I have benefited myself the last two weeks. We've only recently started, actually we started in October, the class on the parables. But I have benefited greatly. And in this parable of the, the wicked husband, and I want to wrap it up by sharing with you the main lesson. Because of their rebellion against divine authority, and even in spite of His great long suffering, national Israel would be judged and would no longer be God's chosen people. Notice how I tried to tie together four key elements. Number one, the element of authority. The element of rebellion against that authority. The element of God's great long suffering. And then the theme of judgment. That's the summary of this parable. National Israel would be judged. Her people, her leaders, they would no longer be God's chosen people because of their rebellion against His authority and His long-suffering. Friend, as we prepare now to offer the Lord's invitation, the real crux of the matter comes down to you and it comes down to me. We too are accountable creatures before God. I promise you that. You don't have to to take my word on, on that. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You and I are accountable. If we're outside of Christ this morning, dear friend, if you're outside of Christ, 
You need to believe on Jesus. He's the only way to be saved. Acts 4.12, you must believe on Him. You must believe strongly enough to repent and to turn from sins. Luke 13.3, you must be willing to confess Christ even before this number if need be. And you must be willing to put Him on in baptism for the remission of your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. God is long-suffering. But don't try to exploit, don't try to take advantage of God's long-suffering. Obey the gospel here today. Brother or sister, if you have done those things as I have, I, I've obeyed the gospel. As children of God, when we lapse and we go back into sin, we are commanded in scriptures to repent, Acts 8, 22, and, and to confess or acknowledge our wrong, 1 John 1, 9. And to pray to God for His forgiveness. And to have others pray for us if need be. James 5 and verse 16. God is a long-suffering God. He's waiting on you to come home. If that's the case and the need in your life. Can we help in any way please? As we stand and as we sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven.